They were an unlikely couple from the start. She was a good girl, and I was always kind of living on the edge. And those differences eventually became irreconcilable. There was no getting along there. It was a fight every morning. The result was a bitter divorce. And the drama's final act would find authorities caught up in a potentially fatal game of he said, she said. She was constantly wishing that man dead. He says, I can and I will bring you down. On Tuesday morning, October 23, 2007, Josh Milliger walked into the Aurora, Missouri car dealership where he worked. As soon as I walked in the door, I noticed my lights flash. And uh, co-workers saying, hey, the phone's been ringing off the hook. Something's going on. Josh checked his messages. They were all from a man named James Mushy. I call him back. He goes, well, this is Sergeant James Mushy, Missouri State Highway Patrol. It'll take me an hour to get there, and you better be standing out front when I get there. So I'm just, oh, my God, what I do? You know, I'm thinking speeding ticket. No, I paid that. I'm thinking, you know, you know, the tags are good on my truck. I mean, a million things going through my brain. But one possibility stood out from all the rest. Josh's ex-wife, Esther Wadley. Since their divorce almost three years earlier, Josh and Esther had been locked in a bitter battle over custody of their daughter. As bad as the divorce was, I actually got thinking she set me up, that she's put drugs in my car. Um, and I actually went out to my vehicle and I crawled underneath it. I tore everything out of the glove box, under the seat. I mean, I looked everywhere. Nothing. Set up or not, Josh was waiting when the unmarked car arrived an hour later. We asked him to come out and sit in our vehicle with us. He was a little hesitant to uh, sit down and talk with us because we wouldn't tell him what we were there to talk about until we were in private. So, I mean, I'm just bewildered. I'm not handcuffed. I haven't read the, uh, you know, read my rights. Josh's suspense didn't last long. And as it turned out, he had been set up just not the way he expected. I said, well, Josh, I, I hate to tell you this, but I've been hired to murder you. Esther Wadley and Josh Milliger first met in 1995 at a Southern California restaurant. Just a bunch of friends out one night. Uh, we're sitting at a local restaurant, and she had walked by, sat down, and we just started talking. A California native, Esther was attending the Western University of Health Sciences, a medical school in Pomona. Josh, originally from Missouri, was a warehouse clerk. She was always kind of the good girl, and I was always kind of the, you know, living on the edge kind of guy. Edgy or not, Esther appreciated Josh's attention. I think she was very insecure about herself. She had brains, and she's a very pretty woman, but she was insecure. Josh appreciated Esther's potential. She was just finishing up her third year of medical school. She had a good, promising job coming up. Within weeks, the couple moved in together. He was attentive, you know, helped her out with the laundry, the housework. It was kind of a mutual give and take relationship that most people would want. Esther graduated in 1996. That same year, she and Josh decided to move to his home state of Missouri for her residency. We decided that Southern California, the rat race, was just a little too much. We knew if we were going to make a big move that when she graduated medical school, then that was the time to do it. The couple bought a house out in the country. Josh took a factory job to help supplement Esther's income as a resident. Practice in medicine does not automatically make you rich. You have student loans to pay back that are extremely expensive. She was working a lot of hours. We tried to spend the weekends together, but it was a very hit and miss time with her work and my work. The couple did manage to hook up long enough to get married. And before the year was out, Esther was pregnant. It was a surprise to both of us, but at the same time, you know, it was uh, a joyous time. 
Esther gave birth to a baby girl in August of 1997, but their joy over their new daughter was soon overshadowed by disagreements about her care. The original plan was for me to continue working and then her stay home with the child. Not too long after my daughter was born, she'd start saying things like, I can't do this, I don't want to do this, I'd rather be at work. According to Josh, that's why he left his job while Esther went back to work. I stayed home with my daughter full time. She went right back into her residency program. However, Esther told her friends and family that Josh quitting his job wasn't her choice. Well, she told me his words were, why do I have to work? I'm married to a doctor. Being a, you know, a doctor at the time, we, we were very financially set. Over the next three years, Josh stayed home. Esther supported the family financially with occasional help from her parents. She supported him. We supported him, too. She had a job 24-7. Uh, after she finished her day at the hospital, she would moonlight at other hospitals from uh, 7 to midnight, picking up more money, all in ER wards. By 2001, just going into work had become a struggle for Esther. She would say things in the mornings like, I don't want to go to work. Why do I have to go to work? It's not fair that I have to go to work. It was a fight every morning for her to go to work and be there on time. But there was more going on than just the average work burnout. In 2002, Esther was diagnosed with bipolar disorder. Some days she would be so lethargic you could barely get her to talk and then you know, five minutes later, boom, you know, she'd be running 90 miles an hour. And the bipolar disorder only exacerbated the problems between Esther and Josh. She did resent the fact that he just quit working after she had the baby. She wasn't happy with him and that she felt like he was a loser. And when Esther's hospital job ended, her new job only compounded the problems in their marriage. She was under contract at a prison in Jefferson City when they were needing a doctor to come up and tend to the inmates. But in June of 2002, the prison contract came to an abrupt end. She said that there were problems with prisoners there and that they just couldn't have a woman doing that job. With their daughter and son-in-law both unemployed, Esther's parents quickly intervened. Her parents bought and opened a clinic for her in Republic, Missouri. We got right in behind it, you know, and we would do anything to make it succeed. Esther seemed to excel in the new environment, too. She was a good doctor, and as far as her personality, the patients all seemed to like her. She was outgoing, very outgoing, and very talkative. Soon, Esther was one of the small community's most popular practitioners. She had a good clientele built up. It kept getting bigger and bigger, and there was a lot more people. And she seemed like she was doing really well. But her thriving practice only increased the friction between Esther and her stay-at-home husband. She uh, kept on going that she wanted to leave him. There was no getting along there. Them two just... They knew how to push each other's buttons. The final break came at the end of 2002. On December 8th, the Barry County Sheriff's Department responded to a domestic disturbance call at Esther and Josh's house. When they arrived, deputies found the couple locked in a heated argument. They proceeded to basically separate us. They sat me down in the living room. They took her outside and uh, interviewed us. According to what Esther told the officers, she'd gone out the evening before to a friend's Christmas party without telling Josh. Thought they're just out Christmas shopping. And Esther had stayed out all night. By 9.30, I'm panicked. I've called the cell phone 20, 30 times. Called a couple of her friends. Hey, have you seen her? I can't find my wife. 7 o'clock in the morning, Josh was calling my house saying, where's Esther? It wasn't long after that, Esther finally came home. According to what she told the deputies, that's when the fight had started. She told us that he accosted her, actually hit her, and said, get out. In his interview with the authorities that morning, Josh told a somewhat different story. 
He not only denied hitting Esther, he also added a new detail to Esther's story why she had stayed out all night. She basically looked at me and very coldly, like it was nothing, said, I spent the night at a hotel with a guy that I met at the party. I told him that was unacceptable and she needed to leave. Esther agreed. Sheriff's deputies escorted her off the premises and filed an incident report. The next day, Esther did some filing of her own. She went straight to attorney's office and filed for divorce. Both Esther's affair and the divorce caught Josh off guard, but she had more surprises in store for him. Esther cut him off financially and even cleaned out the house. It was empty. There was nothing. She took the light bulbs out of the permanent fixtures. Uh, she took the little toilet roll dispenser. She took the paper off the bottom of the shelves and the cabinets. She took everything. Esther found her own place and settled into a contentious custody dispute with Josh over their daughter. She was supposed to like get her the first and third weekend of the month. But if the first fell on a Sunday, she didn't get her daughter. Because in his eyes, that wasn't the first weekend of the month. That's all she talked about. Complained constantly about her husband pushing her buttons, playing games in the divorce case. And the more games Josh played, the more Esther's frustration mounted. She was constantly wishing that man dead. It might have been in her prayers every night that he dropped dead. To add to her stress, in 2003, Esther had to close her clinic. I don't think she has business sense. It just blew my mind that the office was ran the way it was ran. The billing wasn't corrected, and half the time they wouldn't collect the monies that were due. But according to Esther, all of her problems stem from the same source, her soon-to-be ex-husband. She was convinced that, you know, Josh was the bad guy, or at least, you know, mostly to blame for her problems. Even Esther's friends suspected Josh might be behind some of her problems. Josh lost his sugar mama, so to speak. He had to get a job. Oh, my. <laughs> be in the real world. He couldn't just do whatever he did while she worked. And Josh's response? According to Esther's parents, he told Esther that he'd eventually get even. He says, I can and I will bring you down. Coming up, how far will Esther go to get custody of her daughter? Esther was very uh, paranoid about saying the word kill or murder. I couldn't have somebody's death on my conscience. fall of 2007. The past few years had been busy ones for Esther Wadley and Josh Milliger. In 2004, their contentious divorce was finalized. Josh stopped being a stay-at-home dad and started a job with a local car dealership. Esther had closed her clinic and focused most of her energy on getting custody of her daughter from Josh. And though their marriage had ended, their bitter arguments hadn't. A point that became crystal clear on October 17th when Missouri State Police received a phone call from the FBI. My supervisor was contacted by a special agent from the FBI requesting uh, we contact a gentleman by the name of Paul Bell. Bell had called the FBI earlier that afternoon, and he claimed to have information about a murder plot. A former doctor of his by the name of Esther Wadley had contacted him within the past couple of weeks uh, requesting he find a hitman. That evening, Sergeant Mushy drove out to the Bell's farm. James Mushy came to our house, and he asked me if I thought she was serious. I said, well, I'm going to be honest with you. I said, yeah, I'm pretty doggone sure she's serious. According to what Paul told the highway patrolman, it had all started eight days earlier when he'd run into Dr. Wadley at the Christian Service Center. The Christian Service Center is one of those organizations that's nonprofit and helps low-income families with needs. The Bells were occasional clients. It was the end of the crop season, so times were a little tight for us. And when Paul walked in that afternoon, he noticed Esther Wadley, apparently volunteering at the center. 
Paul hadn't seen Esther since he had tried to make an appointment in 2003 and discovered her clinic had closed permanently. I called one day to make an appointment and there was no doctor no more. I had missed her. I, I, I thought of her as a friend, more so than a, a doctor. And Paul greeted Esther like an old friend when he ran into her at the Christian Service Center. I said, long time no see, what are you up to? And she looked at me real funny and she said, do I know you? I said, yeah, you was my doctor. When he came back, he looked at me, he said, you'll never guess who I ran into. And I asked him who it was and he said, Dr. Wadley. And I was tickled. He told me, he says, well, don't be too happy. And I said, why? The reason why, according to what Paul told Sergeant Mushy, had to do with what Esther had asked him that afternoon. She said, I need you to do me a favor, said, I need to get rid of my old man. According to Paul, Esther not only wanted her ex-husband gone, she wanted him dead. She said, I just need to get rid of him totally, that I need him killed. I told her I had some friends in Tennessee. That way nobody ever knew nothing about it. According to Paul and Teresa, Esther had come to their house on October 11th to discuss things further. She sat down in their living room and laid out a plan how she wanted her ex-husband killed. And why did Esther want Josh killed? The way the Bells explained it, it had to do with a custody dispute. They had an ongoing custody battle. She said that with him gone, with him dead, she would get custody of her daughter. As the Bells explained to the police, Esther was willing to pay. Mr. Bell verified, in fact, that he had been paid $200 by Esther Wadley uh, to either murder her ex-husband or to have someone do the job. And the Bells claimed Esther had ended the meeting by promising a bigger payoff. She said, well, said, when it all comes about and it's done and over, they'll be well compensated. According to the Bells, Esther's offer had left them in a quandary. Should they simply keep the $200 or call the cops? At first, we were going to just leave it alone. But it bothered me so bad. I couldn't have that. I couldn't have somebody's death on my conscience. Now the question before Sergeant Mushy and the Missouri authorities was, were the Bells telling the truth? He was a little skeptical because he told me that he may have to have me to take a uh, lie detector test. I said, that's fine and dandy, buddy, because I said, I'll take a hundred of them. I don't care. I said, the truth's the truth. Then Paul Bell slid a small stack of papers across the kitchen table to the sergeant. It had a picture of Josh. It had a picture of her daughter and a handwritten uh, piece of paper that gave Josh's full name, his address, the date of birth, where he worked, a description of his truck. Sergeant Mushy asked Paul Bell if he would call Esther. When it comes to evaluating the truthfulness of an informant, uh, you simply have to verify that uh, in any way you can. Bell agreed, and Sergeant Mushy recorded the ensuing conversation. I just want to say on the tape, Esther was evasive, but it was enough for the sergeant. After he provided me with the paper documents and made the phone call, I was convinced that it was, it was a legitimate case. An arrest would require more evidence, however. Recruiting Sergeant Mike Rogers to play the potential hitman, the investigators returned to the Bell Farm the next day. We place another phone call to uh, Esther Wadley to try to facilitate an undercover meeting that afternoon. My buddy's here. Sir? And he's wanting to meet you and see if you're serious about this. You know what I mean, Byrne? Yeah, that sounds like a setup. She was quite paranoid to meet me. She told Paul that she wasn't supposed to meet anyone. She'd already given him the money. She wasn't supposed to know anything about it until after the job was done. The whole thing was that I'm not supposed to know anything. Well, he wants to talk to you and then see if you want to go through with it and all, for sure. Because I know, you, you know, you, people talk when they're upset. Esther eventually relented. Are you dead serious about it? 
and if so, we need to get together, get this down pat and over with. That afternoon, the Bells drove to the parking lot of a local lumber yard with Sergeant Rogers. Rogers was wearing a wire, and Sergeant Mushy was nearby to monitor the conversation. I was in a surve undercover surveillance vehicle uh, watching. A little before three, Esther pulled into the parking lot. Esther got in the vehicle, and Paul immediately told her, well, this is the guy that is going to do the job. He introduced me as an old friend who was experienced in uh, black operations from the military. Introductions made, the undercover officer moved on to the next step, confirming that Esther wanted Josh dead. He said, but let's get down to basics. Let's get serious. What do you want done? And she he hawed around a little bit. Esther was very uh, paranoid about uh, saying the word kill or murder. Sergeant Rogers forced the issue. She had given Paul a picture of Josh Milliger and written his address and license plate number on the picture. And I showed her that picture and I said, this is the guy you want taken out, right? And she said, yes. But she balked again when Rogers asked for money. She stated that Paul had the money and call her when the job was done. The meeting was over. But as Esther drove away, Sergeant Rogers was confident they'd gotten some incriminating statements on tape. But thanks to a technical glitch, the tape was blank. None of the exchange had been recorded. Our surveillance vehicle, it was still using VHS uh, tapes at the time, and the VHS tape was chewed up by the machine while we were trying to record it. They didn't have it on tape, but the investigators were now convinced that Esther wanted her ex-husband dead. A background check revealed that Esther had good reason to fear that Josh would win their custody battle. A few years prior to this incident, she had been arrested by the Drug Enforcement Administration on a prescription uh, fraud case. It turned out that Esther's clinic hadn't shut down as a result of poor management. According to the indictment, Esther had written unnecessary prescriptions, providing patients with illegal amounts of painkillers. She wanted everybody to like her, so, you know, if they came in and said, hey, I need Xanax, they got Xanax. Eventually, the large number of prescriptions raised a red flag with the DEA. In the resulting sting operation, Esther had illegally prescribed pain medications to undercover agents. Well, of course... All H broke loose at that point, and they DEA raced in and uh, shut things down. She eventually uh, made a plea bargain agreement on four counts of illegally prescribing narcotics. Her major concern was how this was going to affect her ability to get custody of her daughter. Esther's plea deal had allowed her to dodge prison time. Instead, she was sentenced to five years probation. She also had to surrender her medical license and ultimately close her clinic. And just as she feared, the drug conviction had also cost Esther custody of her daughter. I got sole physical legal custody of my daughter. I got 90% of the time. She got visitation of every other weekend. Do you want your daughter living with a felon or do you want your daughter living with uh you know, her father. And uh, if I was guessing, I would say that played heavily on the judge's decision in that case. And if that loss wasn't enough, by the time Paul Bell bumped into Esther at the Aurora Christian Service Center in October of 2007, she'd fallen on hard times. After she lost her medical license, she went to working for Taco Bell and the Christian Center. She had nothing. You know, she didn't have her marriage anymore. Her daughter wasn't there. And that really hurt her self-esteem. And she has real low self-esteem. Her recently diagnosed bipolar disorder didn't help matters either. With bipolar, you don't think before you act. And she jumped into situations where she didn't think. A devastating divorce, financial ruin, and mental illness to the investigators Esther Wadley was clearly a woman on the edge. At that point, we felt it necessary to inform uh, Josh Milliger of, uh, of his ex-wife's plans. 
On the evening of October 23rd, the investigators met with Josh at the car dealership where he worked. We asked him to come out and sit in our vehicle with us. I don't know why. They won't tell me. I'm just basically told to get in the car with these two great big officers. Coming up, the officers deliver what they figured would be shocking news. I laid out that we'd been in negotiations with his ex-wife uh, for us to kill him. But Josh has shocking news of his own. I said, this isn't the first time. And they were just bewildered. They're like, what do you mean this isn't the first time? October 23rd, 2007. Esther Wadley's ex-husband Josh Milliger sat in a parked car outside the Ford dealership where he worked. An investigator from the Missouri Highway Patrol had just informed Josh about an undercover operation conducted days earlier. I laid out basically the information we had had that we had been in negotiations with his ex-wife uh, for us to kill him. The response that came out of my mouth was, again, the officers were taken aback. They said, what do you mean again? I said, this isn't the first time. And they were just bewildered. They're like, what do you mean this isn't the first time? I said, well, you hadn't talked to the DEA? Rogers and Mushy told Josh they knew all about Esther's police record. But did they know the whole story? She blamed me for ruining her life. She blamed it squarely on me. But the way Josh explained it to the officers, Esther's downfall was entirely her fault. While the officers took notes, Josh spent the next hour and a half cataloging his ex-wife's alleged transgressions, starting with the sudden termination of her job with the Missouri prison system. Josh was told she quit, that they advised her to quit because of all the men there. Josh told the officers he'd only learned the truth after Esther filed for divorce. She hadn't quit. Esther had been fired. She was having an inappropriate relationship with an inmate that the prison officials found out about. According to Josh, he suspected the affair had been Esther's first attempt to have him killed. She had found a gentleman who had a very violent background who was getting ready to be released on parole and um, she basically wanted him to murder me that particular murder plot fizzled once esther lost her job josh claimed but did she stop trying not according to josh it was about 2003 divorce was in full swing and i was driving home from work and i just hear this banging sound two quick bang bang metallic on metallic pinging sound and i thought what in the world was that josh claimed it was only when he pulled into the driveway and exited the truck that he realized what had just happened i realized there's two bullet holes in the door of my truck josh told the detectives that he had called the local sheriff's office but they didn't make a report was josh telling the truth was the plot involving Paul Bell merely the latest in a long string of attempts on her ex-husband's life? The police couldn't be sure, but they couldn't take any chances either. We believed that she was serious. If she wasn't going to use our undercover officer as the hitman, we were afraid that she might find someone else to do it. However, as the investigators explained to Josh that night, there was one small catch. They don't feel that they have enough information at this time to arrest her. And their advice to Josh? Sit tight. We discussed being extra cautious, looking over his shoulder. They told me basically do nothing. Be aware of my surroundings and told me not to do anything different. Josh promptly ignored the warning. Less than 24 hours after meeting with investigators, he sent his daughter to stay with relatives out of state. Even though they told me anything that I did could potentially jeopardize their case, <clears throat> it was unacceptable. Uh, within 10 minutes of them leaving, uh, I was making arrangements for her to leave. Unaware that Josh had already potentially jeopardized their case by sending his daughter out of town, Sergeants Rogers and Mushy continued to build their case against Esther. 
Sergeant Rogers had other telephone conversations with her, trying to put the plan together, mainly for her to give some more money to us. I ain't done this for nothing, and that's what I've got so far is nothing. Do you understand that? I mean, does that not make sense? Esther was extremely reluctant to close the deal with the hitman over the phone. Dr. Wiley was very cautious in what words she had used. She wanted to meet privately. What she wanted to do was make sure by meeting me personally on a one-on-one -on -one basis that I was not a police officer. I wouldn't have had the problem in doing that other than what she had in mind is not how you conduct business. Slowly, over the next couple of weeks, Sergeant Rogers worked to gain Esther's trust. But the first weekend in November, the investigation suffered a serious setback. Esther discovered that her daughter was out of town. She got visitation of every other weekend. My daughter was out of state, so uh, I missed the drop off. According to Josh, the result was a confrontation outside the Ford dealership. She comes flying in, slams on the brakes, and jumps out of that car. And she's just, where's my daughter, da, da, da? I mean, just screaming at me. And when he explained their daughter was out of state? She goes, well, I'm going to take you back to court. I mean, she just went belligerent on me. Got in the car and drove off. On November 29th, Esther had her final phone conversation with Sergeant Rogers. In it, she essentially canceled the hit. She says, you say you won't do anything if I don't give you money, and I'm telling you you're not getting money, so go on down the road. Why had Esther told the hitman to hit the road? Josh had inadvertently given Esther grounds to challenge the custody ruling by taking their daughter out of state and defying their final custody agreement. We have what's known as the abducted child law. And that law prevents a person who's been involved in a divorce from taking a child out of the state without the permission of the other parent. Esther said, I'm going to go to the prosecuting attorney and try to get criminal proceedings brought against him for denial of visitation. And if Esther called the whole thing off, wouldn't the case against her collapse too? The state law in Missouri is, is that if you do show such an obvious renunciation of purpose, that in and of itself is a renunciation of the conspiracy. But she'd never get the chance to file denial of visitation charges against Josh. On December 3rd, officers from Missouri Highway Patrol and Aurora City Police knocked on Esther's door. Dr. Wadley answered the door, and I told her that she was under arrest for a conspiracy to commit murder. She went quietly. There were no protests and no questions. You could almost feel her melt when you put the handcuffs on her. She knew what she was being arrested for. Coming up, the case goes to court. Esther had taken significant steps to have her ex-husband murdered. But can prosecutors make it stick without testimony from a key witness? The man that was supposed to do the hit, why didn't he testify? On the morning of December 3rd, 2008, Esther Wadley's trial began at the Lawrence County, Missouri courthouse. Charged with conspiring to murder ex-husband Josh Milliger, Esther had spent the year since her arrest in custody. She was held uh, without bond due to the fact she was out on federal probation. The probation stemmed from the 2004 case that had ended with Esther pleading guilty to prescription fraud. But this time, facing up to 15 years in prison for the conspiracy charge, Esther chose to take her chances in court. She was confident from the start that she will be exonerated of these charges. Why was Esther so confident? For starters, the judge had ruled any discussion of Esther's prior drug conviction off limits. That had no relevance whatsoever to this case, was inadmissible in the case that we were trying. So when Esther Wadley walked into the courtroom that morning, jurors didn't see a convict who'd gone from running her own clinic to working at Taco Bell. They saw an attractive, successful woman. You have a very bright, driven, 
young woman who uh, made her way through med school. In his open, the prosecutor told jurors not to judge Esther on her appearance, however. Instead, he claimed the evidence would reveal she was a bitter woman. According to the prosecutors, Esther not only blamed Josh for the devastating divorce that derailed her life and cost her custody of their daughter, she was determined to make him pay. Esther had taken significant steps to have her ex-husband murdered. She had met with me and openly identified her ex-husband as the man to be killed. In its open, the defense declared that Esther was merely the victim of miscommunication and an overzealous investigation. Officer Rogers was very solicitous, very leading, very suggestive in what it was that he thought that she wanted him to do. She never was totally acknowledging she wanted him to do anything. The prosecution's first witness was Josh, who walked the jury through the nasty divorce and the resulting custody battle. Then the prosecutor put his star witness on the stand, Paul Bell. In his testimony, Paul detailed how Esther had approached him at the Christian Service Center and supposedly asked for help hiring a hitman. She said, I know you've got friends and lots of them. And said, I know you know someone they can do the job. I said, yeah, I probably do. Paul Bell is one of those kind of people that likes to please other people and he could please Esther by doing what she wanted. On cross, Esther's attorney questioned whether Paul had read more into Esther's comments than she intended. The defense uh, attorney tried to show Paul Bell as a simple man who really didn't uh, understand what was going on. There never was any intent to conspire to violate the law. There was uh, both a misunderstanding and miscommunication by Mr. Bell. Of course, it wasn't entirely a case of Esther's word against Paul's. Sergeant James Mushy also took the stand for the prosecution. I testified on our meetings that, sh you know, evidence given to us by Paul Bell, the pictures, the documents, the money. Sergeant Mushy's testimony also walked the jurors through the parking lot meeting where Sergeant Rogers posed as the potential hitman. Sergeant Rogers held up the photograph of Josh Melliger and asked if that was for sure the right guy that, that she wanted killed, and she indicated that was the right guy. That's what Sergeant Mushy testified, at least. But due to an embarrassing technical glitch, the conversation hadn't been caught on tape. Obviously, we would have liked to have had a nice color video and audio of her meeting with uh, Sergeant Rogers. The prosecutors did have Sergeant Rogers, however. Mike Rogers, in my opinion, was the focal point of this entire case because Sergeant Mushy was really not a first-person, hands-on conversant in any conversation with Esther Wadley. But on December 4th, the prosecution rested without calling Sergeant Rogers to the stand. The man that was supposed to do the hit, why didn't he testify? According to the defense, the answer was obvious. If Rogers had taken the stand, Esther's attorney could have cross-examined him about the November 29th phone call to Esther. Mike Rogers said, I'm not going to do anything unless you give me money. She said, I'm not giving you money, so you need to just go on down the road because that's the end of this. Under Missouri law, the renunciation of purpose was enough to clear her of conspiracy charges. So according to her attorney, that final phone call with Mike Rogers meant Esther was innocent. Even if you don't believe anything about the miscommunication, you've got to believe that there was an obvious, unequivocal renunciation of purpose. In fact, the defense was so confident that prosecutors had failed to present a convincing case they also rested without putting Esther on the stand. They cross-examined everybody, which was maybe five or six people. Um, they gave a closing statement, and that was it. According to Esther's attorney, there was no need for her testimony anymore. No one ever said anything about killing her husband on any of the tapes. All evidence in the case suggested that Mike Rogers was told, you're not getting any money from me. I don't know what Paul Bell had you do. I don't know what you're going to do. And when the case went to the jury on the afternoon of December 4th, 
Esther appeared every bit as confident as she had the day before. She believed that she had never crossed any line, legal line, that would bring this down on her. December 4th, 2008. It was a year and a day since Esther Wadley had been arrested and charged with conspiring to murder ex-husband Josh Milliger. And she'd already spent every one of those 366 days in jail. Being on federal probation or parole, the marshals kept her in custody until the trial. And now it was up to a jury to determine if Esther remained in custody. One thing was certain, at least. She wouldn't have to wait long for an answer. The jury came back after just a short deliberation. I was so nervous when that jury walked back in there. I mean, I was just, I was shaking. But when the foreman rose to read the verdict, it was Esther's turn to be shaken. The judge asked him what their verdict was. And, Your Honor, we find the defendant, Esther Wadley, guilty. It was like somebody knocked the wind out of her sails. The verdict also shocked her parents, who were convinced that their daughter was not guilty. We were devastated. We all sat there or held each other for 10 or 15 minutes. Could not believe it. Even more devastating, the judge gave Esther the maximum sentence, 15 years. The judge found it ironic and inconsistent with the very makeup of someone who was a doctor to consider something like this. He said, you took an oath to heal, not harm. And you could just kind of see a little anger in his face. From the drug charges and divorce to the custody battle and the conspiracy murder conviction, Esther's downfall has been complete. It's unfortunate that a woman uh, with her intelligence and her obvious resources threw that all away. And the man she was convicted of conspiring to murder, he was relieved. Six years of stress and drama and aggravation I just want her out of my life. Ironically, Josh Milliger managed to achieve what Esther couldn't, get rid of a troublesome ex. The love that people have for their children can overcome anything. And it can, it can manifest itself in a good way or a bad way. People can do unbelievably great things because of their family, or they can be unbelievably evil because of their family. And Esther chose the wrong way.